Okay, turn your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Our continuing expository study here of the book of 1 Timothy. Um, this will be halfway through. 1 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to start out here with verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. The text says, man, all right? I don't care what your new perversion from the Vatican says. The King James Bible says a man desires the office of an bishop, or the, yeah, desires the office of a bishop. <laughs> I'll get it out yet. You know, you can't duck that thing. Verse two: A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Now the interesting word there is apt. The word apt, A-P-T. What does that mean? Well, Webster's 1828 Dictionary says apt. Number one, there are five definitions here. Number one, fit, suitable, as he was used very apt metaphors. Number two, having a tendency, liable, used of things, as wheat on moist land is apt to blast or be winter killed. Number three, inclined, disposed, customarily used of persons, as men are too apt to slander others. Number four, ready, Quick, used of the mental powers as a pupil apt to learn and on, an, apt, an opt wit. Uh, number five, qualified fit. Okay, and then he gives a few more things where I'm not going to read that. But the point is the term there, a man who's going to be in leadership position in the church, in a, in a group of, of believers, an assembly of believers, he should be apt to teach. He should be qualified. He should be fit to be able to teach. Okay. That's what it's talking about there. Now, when I say qualified, that doesn't mean he has to have a PhD. Okay, there are no PhDs in the New Testament for a Christian. Okay, in fact, the doctors of the law were usually the ones that were giving Jesus Christ a hard time. The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. All right, so you don't have to be, quote unquote, highly educated to be a man who shepherds the flock, to be a bishop here in context. John chapter 21, you can turn there in your Bible. Here's the, the real job for a preacher, okay? An elder in your New Testament here. John chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. Says here, so when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Joseph, Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Joseph, Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verse 17. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Now, of course, why did Jesus Christ say that three times to Peter? Because Peter had denied him three times. Interesting there, the third time Peter is grieved by Jesus asking those questions. I bet you the Lord was grieved when Peter denied him for the third time. See, Jesus is kind of getting a little jabbing at Peter there and saying, Now get a hold of this thing, Peter. You denied me three times, so I'm going to tell you three times that you're supposed to feed my sheep. Okay? And don't fall for this agape phileo myth thing. That's a bunch of nonsense. Those two words are used interchangeably different times throughout the Bible. Um, that stuff is all just nonsense. The fact is, a good preacher won't leave the sheep feeling hungry when they listen to one of his sermons. Okay? okay? And you hear that a lot, by the way. I've heard that. I remember hearing that many times down through the years I'll hear people and they say I was going to such and such a church but I just wasn't being fed you know why well because the hireling is up there trying to get the people to help pay off the big building and the hireling is usually 501c3 in most of these churches that are out there today and so he has his mouth silenced basically he has a gag order so to speak when it comes to politics and other controversial things um, anything that affects public policy is under the IRS code. But you can watch my house church series of videos and I show you from the IRS's website where it says that. Anything that affects public policy. 
uh, the preacher's not supposed to do anything that affects public policy. So they are silenced. That's why a lot of times you're not fed when you go to these church buildings. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 3. You can turn back there in your Bible. When we're doing these expository studies, by the way, you would just probably pretty much want to keep your hand there in 1 Timothy, you know, chapter 3, which we are at right now, because we're going to be coming back here, going verse by verse through the entire chapter. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 says, Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. Now turn in your Bible to 1 Peter chapter 5. Now remember who Jesus was talking to there, John chapter 21, he was talking to Peter. So let's see what Peter has to say here. Did Peter learn his lesson? Mm -hmm. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God. Peter's got it now. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Now when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So that's the job of an elder. Here in 1 Timothy chapter 3, it's spoken of as a bishop. The position there. Okay? You're supposed to feed the flock of God. Very important. Turn back to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 4 and 5. Okay, it says here, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Very true. There's nothing more sickening than a pastor that has bratty children. Children that are not obedient to him. It doesn't look too good for the preacher. You know, you got this, these children running around and acting like wild animals, and you go, whose children are they? Well, that's the pastor. That's our elder here. You know, that's one of the elders over there, you know, because you should have more than one elder. You know, that's his children. No, sorry, doesn't work. If he can't take care, if his wife is running him, you know, that, I'm sure that never happens, right? Yeah. If his wife is running him and his children are running him, how's he going to take care, you know, of the church of God? How's he going to protect you? How's he going to teach you false, you know, about false doctrine, warn you about false doctrine? Not going to do a very good job of it. You say, well, then a man who desires to be a bishop, he must be married and he must have at least two children, right? Well, then that would disqualify Paul, wouldn't it? And that would disqualify me from being a preacher. Because I'm married. You know, I wasn't for many years while I was in ministry, but now I'm married. But I don't have two children. You know, we need to have at least two children. I had a guy write that to me the one time. Uh, okay. Um, well, that, and that would disqualify a lot of people. Including Paul. On two counts, Paul would be disqualified from preaching. See? It doesn't work. But let me say it this way. What's given here in 1 Timothy chapter 3 is the ideal situation, what it should be. I mean, if you have men to choose from, yeah, you want a guy that's older and has at least two children. Now, you might have a guy who's married and has two children or more, and yet he's not qualified to be in a leadership position. He just doesn't have it in him. He's, he's just more of a servant more than, than a leader. You know, Just because he's married and has two children, at least, does not automatically qualify him for a leadership position. Okay, so that doesn't work either. But let me just say this. A man who's single can serve the Lord without distraction. But when that man gets married, now he has greater insight to Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ has a bride. And that bride is part of his body. So a married man, in a sense, can understand the Lord Jesus better than a single man. And in like manner, a man who's married and has children can understand the position of God the Father dealing with us, His children. So it gives greater insight into, you know, ministry. You know, if you're a man and you have a son, you can imagine what it was like for God the Father to have to, to face giving up His Son to die on the cross to pay for somebody else's sin. 
See, I can't really imagine that because I don't have a son at this point in time. Now, you know, the Lord can, can give us children in the future, and, and you know, when that's his time, uh, then that'll happen. You know, I trust the Lord on that. Uh, right now, we haven't been married that long and, and whatever else, and so, you know, uh, when in the Lord's timing. We are totally open to the Lord's timing. Um, it's up to Him. But just because a man does not have a wife and a man does not have children does not automatically disqualify him from being a bishop. Again, what's the standard? The standard is how well does he do preaching this book? Look at verse 6. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 6. Now here's what you really got to watch out for. Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Now, I like to pick on this one little false prophet because he's easy to pick on, because uh, he's just so ridiculous in so many ways. Um, Stephen Anderson, independent fundamental Baptist preaching. Yeah, uh-huh, sure. Um, this novice uh, has been preaching since he was in his late teens, you know, uh, I guess full-time since he's been in his 20s. I'm not sure when he exactly started. But he's married, and he has a whole bunch of children, you know. Well, then, bless God, he's, he's qualified to preach because he meets the qualifications there. No, he's a novice. The guy doesn't know the Bible. It's not because he didn't go to Bible college, okay. It's because his attitude is one of pride and arrogance, you watch the guy preach, he's one of the most prideful, arrogant little children that you ever see. He throws temper fits, he throws his Bible down, he kicks the pulpit, you know, and, and throws a little hissy fit. Uh, he sounds like a little, uh, a, a little teenage girl throwing a, a hissy fit when he screams, you know. What is he? He's a novice, okay? That's why he's come out with all this after the tribulation stuff. Which, by the way, he got from Marvin Rosenthal, a converted Jew, which is kind of funny because Stephen Anderson hates the Jews. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be doing a video on that in the future. But the fact is, this Marvin Rosenthal came out with a book. Three years later, Stephen Anderson is being converted into being, you know, post-trib, pre-wrath post-trib. Marvin Rosenthal's system. Interesting coincidence. And nobody really taught that whole nonsense before Marvin Rosenthal. Okay, they want you to believe that Christians always believed pre-wrath, uh, post-trib pre-wrath, um, and the, all through the years, then in 1830, the pre-tribbers came along and ruined everything. No, sorry, it doesn't work that way. Um, <laughs> that's just ridiculous. And again, I've proved that in other studies. I won't get into it here. But you've got to watch out for a novice coming along because they'll start doing things and saying very wild things, and the devil will exalt them and lift them up. Why? Because they can make a mess of things. Just like Stephen Anderson is doing right now. A lot of people think because he uses the King James Bible that he's legitimate. He's not legitimate. Oh, buddy Brian, he's got a wife and he has children. Lots of children. Doesn't mean he's legitimate. Okay? And there are single men out there that can out-preach him. And there are men that are married without children that can out-preach him ten times. You know, better preaching than what Stephen Anderson can bring forth. And, you know, and his claim to fame is because he got his butt kicked by a bunch of Border Patrol guys. You know, standing up for the Constitution. Da -da 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 -da. You know, yeah, whatever. But another thing I want to make a point here, it says about he must have a good report of them which are without. How can you have a good report if you're a teenager? A good report takes time, Okay. You need to be able to go out there in the workforce a little bit. You need to have some battle scars, so to speak. You need to go out there. You need to be in ministry. You need to study for a little while. That's why if you're really, really young, early 20s, late teens, early 20s, you're not ready for ministry yet. I'm sorry, you're just not. Jesus Christ went into ministry on this earth when he was 30. Are you better than him? Okay, it takes some time to grow up to be a bishop. Verse 8, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre. Okay, what does double-tongued mean? I'll give you an example. 
Oh, hi, brother. Oh, it's so good to see you here this Sunday. It's so nice to see you. Oh, we've missed seeing you. Oh, we just, I'm so blessed by you. Oh, I just think you're a wonderful person. I saw that guy again. Yeah, he's so stupid. He doesn't know the button. Oh, hi. You know, see, what is that? Double tongue. Somebody who's a hypocrite. All right. Somebody that in church, they're, you know, in the assembly of the saints, they're going, you know, oh, I just thank the Lord for doing such wonderful things in our lives. And oh, if only everyone could know the love of God and blah, 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 blah. And you get them outside of the assembly of the saints. And it's, hey, you got to hear this joke I heard, okay, about this truck driver and this woman along the road. And uh-huh, sure, yeah, right. What are they? Double-tongued disqualified from being a deacon. You don't want somebody who's double-tongued. Or here's another good one. I'll give you another good one. The Word of God calls us all to a good life and we all need to, to be saved according to the Word of God. You come to that guy in, in private and you say, that King James Bible you hold up, is that the Word of God? Perfect and pure and preserved and everything? Oh, that, the King James? No, it's just a translation. Mm -hmm. What is he? Double-tongued. Double-tongued snake. Little double tongue coming out there. Watch out for that. Continuing. Romans chapter 12 verse 9 says here, Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. If you abhor things that are evil and cleave to things that are good, you're not going to be double-tongued. Okay? Your love is to be without dissimulation. Dissimulation means hypocrisy. All right. First Timothy, chapter three, verse nine. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Now, if you remember back there in the study on First Timothy, chapter one, verses five and nineteen said about having a good conscience. Hmm. Very interesting. Again. If you have some guy that's in church ministry that's in that's a elder in the church, we'll say, a guy who is leading the flock, if that guy's got a secret life looking at pornography, he doesn't have a pure conscience. If that guy's secretly taking some money that he shouldn't be, you know, from the offering, he doesn't have a pure conscience. If he's telling dirty jokes at work and using profanity at work, but coming into the assembly of the saints and saying, Oh, bless God, glory to God, brother, oh, Praise you, Jesus. He doesn't have a pure conscience. A man like that is disqualified from being in the position of deacon. Okay? 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10. And let these also first be proved, and let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. They have to be proved? Yeah, sure. Turn over to chapter 5, verse 22. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22. I want to show you something very important. Okay, it says here, lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be partaker of other men's sins, keep thyself pure. Hmm, remember the pure conscience there? But see, what's going on there is, you're not to lay hands suddenly on any man. In other words, laying hands on them, laying of the hands on, you know, of the presbytery, you know, to, to ordain somebody, to pray over a man, to put him into a position of ministry. You don't just get this guy that comes in and says, you know, Oh, glory to God, I'm, you know, really want to serve the Lord and blah, 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 and he really talks the talk well. Talking the talk doesn't do it. You also have to walk the walk, okay? And there's a lot of people that you need to be real careful of, right? I've seen that thing. I have made the mistake numerous times of endorsing ministries, and then later on, somebody writes and they say, Brian, uh, you endorsed so-and-so. Are you aware that they're teaching whatever? And I look and they send, I say, well, send me a video. I don't, I'm not going to just take your word for it. Send me a video. They send me a video and I go, oh, brother, I can't believe I did this thing. You know, man, I, I laid hands suddenly on a man and just endorsed him because I saw two or three of his videos and I thought he was standing for the King James Bible and whatever. <sighs> and it's real bad right now. You know, people write me and they say, what other good preachers can you recommend? Well, I recommend Greg Miller. Um, as far as regular sermons are concerned, uh, Brother Ed uh, on Edward PF123, I think it is, um, his channel, he's got good stuff. You won't hear Brother Ed cutting on the King James Bible. Uh, I endorse his channel. Um, 
Doug Stauffer. I endorse his stuff. Um, that doesn't mean I agree with these guys in every single point of doctrine. They don't agree with me in every single point of doctrine, you know. There are some things that, you know, we'll disagree on. But primarily, the main doctrines, we're in agreement. And I can endorse those guys. Because um, I've known them. I've known them for years. Uh, we've, I've seen their videos. They've, they put my, I put their videos on my channel. They, they endorse my stuff. Um, uh, Brother Patrick and James from Ex-Catholics for Christ, uh, they do some good stuff. Uh, you know, um, there's there's a couple of them. You can go to my main channel page here on YouTube, and you can look at the related channels. They're the people I endorse. Um, I was endorsing Mike Hoggard for a while, and then I found out he has some doubts about eternal security. I can't endorse him. You know, he's non-dispensational. I can't endorse somebody who's non-dispensational. I just can't do it. Uh, does that mean I think that Mike Hoggard is a lost heretic on his way to hell? No, I don't think that. I think he's... he's uh, deceived on a few issues and I think he's too prideful to change to be very frank with you um, does that mean he puts out some all rotten videos no he puts out some good stuff some very good stuff and I'd like to be able to lay hands on him so to speak and say I endorse this guy but I can't somebody who's non-dispensational I just can't do it uh, Ken Hovind another good example Ken Hovind is a saved man I don't doubt that man's salvation but he got messed up Got messed up in the Patriot movement. He's now post-trib. I cannot endorse Ken Hovind. You know, anybody that goes along and tries to check out Ken Hovind's stuff on evolution, you know, creation science versus evolution, they're going to see Ken Hovind's in jail. You know, and not for the right reason. I can't endorse him. You know, Ken Hovind is one of the men that, that basically calls me to go into the ministry. But I can't endorse him. It's a shame. But we'll continue on here. So you have a, a man there who's a uh, wants to wants to be a deacon. He has to be proved first. Okay. Now look at First Timothy chapter three verse eleven. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers. They shouldn't be double tongued either. Sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children in their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. And again, you can see there, compare the deacon to the bishop. They have many of the same things that they have to, you know, qualifications that they have to meet. Okay. Verse 14, 1 Timothy 3, 14. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Wait a second. Then that teaches that we should have church buildings, right? Because it says the house of God right there. I've had some of the brethren point that verse out. And they say, see, it says house of God. How do you behave yourself in the house of God if it's not a, if it's not a building? See, 1 Peter chapter 2. Turn there. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Okay, it says here, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God, and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house. Does it say that you build a spiritual house? Out of limestone, or marble, or, you know, brick, or something like that, or concrete? No, it says, ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable, acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So then what is the house of God? Ye also, as lively stones, are built up to form the house of God. Now, the lively stones, when they get together, I always liken it to little Lego blocks and you have this little Lego block here and this little Lego block there. They click together. And another Lego block clicks together. And then another one, another one, another, another, another. And, and before you know it, these lively stones click together to form a church. Okay? You say, well then, when, the, when you're not clicked together with other believers, then you're not the church anymore. No, that's stupid. There's one church. One body. In spite of what anybody tries to tell you. Okay? That's not Catholic doctrine. That's Bible doctrine. See, the Catholics come along and they say, there's only one true church. And Christians go, well, then I must deny it. No, 
you must see what the Bible says. And the Bible teaches one true church. Okay? Many members of that one body, but one church. Okay? Just because the Catholics believe it doesn't mean it's wrong. All right? That's stupid when people start doing that. Oh, the Catholics teach it, so it must be wrong. No, it's right. It's what the Bible teaches. You're in the church all the time. You never become not part of the church. All right? You're in the church. You're sealed under the day of redemption. Okay? But when you come together, when the assembling of the saints happens, now those members of the church, the members of the body of Christ, are now coming together to form a house, the house of God. So when you have the assembly of the saints happening, you're to behave yourself in the house of God. All right? There is a certain hierarchy there. The men who are the elders that oversee the flock, they are there and they teach the word of God to the people. And you have this elder and he says, well, so-and-so needs help. And I was talking to so-and-so and we went out and I was discipling these people over here. There's another church you know, group that's going to start over that way, another fellowship. You know, brother so-and-so, could you go over and, you know, you're living in that area. Could you go teach those people? Sure, yeah, sounds good. Those elders, it's their job to oversee the flock. And when that flock comes in, it's the men's job to learn from the elders and the women too. They're supposed to sit there and listen. But it's the men that can be the ones that ask the questions. And then the men go home and they teach their wives. See, that's the structure of the New Testament church. All right? So... 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15 does not prove that you should have a building and call it the house of God, a physical building. Uh-uh. No. Sorry. And you say, well, Brian, you know, okay, you keep making a big deal about this. Yeah, I'm making a big deal about it because there's a lot of people going to hell that are trusting in their building membership to get them to, get them to heaven. And it doesn't work. And there's a lot of people that live a certain way when they come to church. And they don't live that way when they're outside of church never realizing that they never leave the church. That they're, wherever they are, they are the church. See, they, ne they don't realize that stuff. You know, well, I certainly wouldn't do this in church, but I'll do it here. See, that's my problem. That's my big issue with this. And I know I was raised in church buildings, okay? And when this stuff first started to come to me and people started to tell me this stuff, it was like, what are you talking about? We're in the church all the time, huh? I don't live in the church all the time. That's a building. But you know, as I began to study the Word and I began to, the Holy Spirit began to show me these things, I changed, I submitted to what the Bible says. Continuing. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It says here, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, Received up into glory. You can read about that in Acts chapter 1. He was received up into glory. He went up, and we're going to go up eventually too. I'm looking forward to that. I know a lot of you are too. To go up to be with Him in glory. Alright? Um, but it's interesting. Because this verse here is one of the most attacked in the entire King James Bible. Most of the new perversions will attack this verse. Very strange that they would do that. The clearest verse in the Bible on the fact that Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh and they attack it. Oh, I'm sorry. They, they make it more accurate. Let's see how they make it more accurate. NIV. 1 Timothy 3.16 in the NIV. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up into glory. Wow. Who was the he appeared in the, or appeared in the flesh there? Who was the he? They would say, well, Jesus. Uh, okay. Um, do I appear in the flesh? Mm -hmm. Do you appear in the flesh? I hope so, yeah. <laughs> you know, if you don't have a body of flesh, you know, you got some issues, you know. But we all appear in a body of flesh. But we're not all God manifest in the flesh. Why would the NIV take that out? How about the English Standard Version? Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. He. 
Strange, why are they taking that out? How about the message? This is good for comic relief. The message. He appeared in a human body. Why can't they say man? You know, he appeared in a human body. Was proved right by the invisible spirit. Was seen by angels. He was proclaimed among all kinds of peoples. Believed in all over the world. Taken up into heavenly glory. Yeah, okay. The message is a nutty piece of garbage. New King James Version. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in glory. You say, wow, praise the Lord. The New King James Version is just as good as the King James Bible. It just removes the archaic language, right? Well, there's just one problem there because right beside the word God, there's a little thing there and you go down to the footnote and it says, 1 Timothy 3.16, N-U text reads who. So it's he who instead of God. So you see, those users of the New King James Version, they read it in their text and they go, oh, see it reads just like the King James, but what's this footnote all about? And they go down and they read and it says, no, actually it was just he who, like the other new versions. So while they put the right reading into the text, they put the Alexandrian perversion into the footnote calling the text into question. See, and there's a whole bunch of other issues with the New King James Version. All right, New King James Version is just another satanic new version. Don't use it. How about the New American Standard Bible? By common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. He who was revealed in the flesh was vindicated in the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. So only the King James Bible really gets it right. God was manifest in the flesh. All right. So that's going to be it for 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, don't bother with these new versions. All right. Any Bible version that would take the name of God out of 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, any of them that would do that, they're from the devil. They're not from the Lord. The Lord would not inspire that kind of thing. Okay. Stick with your King James Bible and... And uh, read it, believe it, and witness for Jesus Christ. So that's going to be it for First Timothy chapter 3. And uh, we'll be doing First Timothy chapter 4 here next, uh, for the next week. So that's going to be it. Thank you for watching.